Well, thanks for staying with us on The Real Story. Our next guest is really front and center because we've been talking about pushing off our presidential primaries because of COVID-19. Connecticut Secretary of the State Denise Merrill joining me right now. How are you doing over there? I'm good. Home, as you can tell. <laughs> Me as well. All right, so we're in an election year, which is major and big, especially for your office. COVID-19, though, doesn't know that, obviously, and we've had to make changes because of it. Uh, our primary has been pushed off to June 2nd. What is that going to look like at this point? Uh, well, we are planning like mad for this uh, June 2nd event because we really don't know who's in, who's out, what's going to happen. So uh, we have an extensive plan where we're working with uh, our local registrars and clerks because, as you know, uh, register, uh, elections are all administered at the local level, at the town level. So this will be a very large challenge for us. Uh, we are anticipating that lots of people will want to avail themselves of absentee ballots uh, because of the governor's emergency order to stay inside. So this is the biggest question mark for us because in Connecticut, we cannot do vote by mail entirely. Uh, we have very strict state constitutional laws that cannot be overridden even by the governor because these laws are in, are in the Constitution, not in statute. So um, we will have to make some accommodation for that. It's very difficult because we're not used to having that many absentee ballots. Uh, so, And we will have to make sure our, our polling places are safe and that we have enough poll workers. I think you saw some of that on display in the Wisconsin primary the other day. This is no easy task. What are the discussions with the governor's office right now? I know he was talking with legislative leaders. Do you have to go as far as a constitutional change? Well, it depends what we need to do. Um, you know, we are, it's still kind of a moving target because we don't know, I don't have a solid ballot until the end of April uh, because there are still candidates uh, dropping out of the race, suspending their campaigns. So when we see what that looks like, uh, at this point, we will have both a Republican and a Democratic primary unless some of these candidates uh, change their minds. And so what that looks like is um, a full-fledged election as we would have had on April 28th. And um, at this point, it means all polling places will be open, but we will have to make some accommodations that we can make without a change to the Constitution. For example, we can change polling places to allow more people to be in there at a safe distance. We can, of course, uh, buy equipment to make the poll workers safe, gloves. Uh, masks, whatever we need at the time. Uh, we did get a $5 million grant from the federal government to help us cover the costs because there will have to be additional uh, poll workers, there will have to be additional uh, town clerk assistance to uh, manage all the absentee ballots and that sort of thing. Uh, but I think we have a pretty good plan in place. We're working with all those folks at the local level and at the state level. And the governor and I talk almost every day about what we can do to make this an easier process. You actually are advocating canceling the presidential primary because of Bernie Sanders dropping out. Is that correct? Well, I would just say that's my opinion. I think I, I hope the candidates such as Bernie Sanders see that when we have to hold an election in this manner uh, where people are basically risking their health to vote and no one should have to make a choice between their health and their vote. Uh, I would hope these candidates would find a way to allow us to, uh, if not cancel the election, at least make some accommodation with their respective parties to withdraw or to, um, you know, to enable us to have a safer election. Uh, I am disappointed because most of them have suspended their campaigns. Bernie Sanders is an example. He has announced that he will suspend his campaign. However, he still has announced also and let us know that he wants to continue to be on the ballot uh, for his own purposes. So until we get a formal withdrawal from any of these candidates, we cannot remove their names from the ballot by law. What is it looking like on the Republican side? Obviously, President Donald Trump is running. You were saying mathematically another candidate couldn't necessarily win against him in Connecticut, but there are other Republican candidates on the ballot, correct? There is one other. His name is Rocky De La Fuente, and he's sort of a perennial presidential candidate. 
He's on the ballot in a lot of different states. And he has let us know also that even though he hasn't had much attention and that basically, mathematically, the race is over, uh, he still wants to be on our ballot. So that would require uh, some action from the governor. We could override that statute and just insist that anyone who had suspended their campaign would not be allowed to, or we could decide if we wanted to allow them on the ballot. And that does seem to me a particularly meaningless situation. You know, at the time when we decided to put him on the ballot, there were two other uh, candidates still in the Republican race. One was Bill Weld from Massachusetts. He has since withdrawn. So that leaves us with a situation that seems very uh, predetermined. If you were able to expand uh, voting by mail or allow voting by mail in Connecticut, what would it look like for a June 2nd primary? Because it sounds like as of right now, the June 2nd primary right now still going on. You'd need all these candidates to uh, suddenly decide to withdraw their names from the ballot. Is that going to happen in two months? So that's obviously why you're planning uh, to still hold the presidential primary. But if you were able to expand voting by mail, would it? Would you still have poll workers? What would that look like? They'd have to sit and collect the uh, ballots that were mailed in? Well, you see, even if we wanted to do voting by mail, we could not ever do it entirely. First of all, we'd need a constitutional amendment. That requires a vote on the ballot uh, by all people in the state. It's a referendum, essentially. And so we could, we could not possibly manage that, even if we wanted to. Um, if we, if there, there will be probably more people voting absentee, because under the state constitution, if you are unable to get to the polls due to illness, you can get an absentee ballot. Uh, and that's what we're trying to make sure people understand. Uh, so I, will ima I would imagine there will be increased absentee ballots. Uh, but that, that does mean the polling places are still open. We'll probably have fewer polling places open uh, due to the dangers of having people too close together at the polling place. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think we could ever really go entirely vote by mail without a great deal of change of what we're already doing. For example, states like Oregon and Washington, Montana, uh, Michigan now, there's about 10 states now doing vote by mail, and there's a big call for it around the country. It would be a substantial change from how we do things now. Uh, it would mean, in some cases, some states do have polling places open, others don't. A lot of them have various methods for checking signatures electronically. We'd have to develop all that. Um, even for this fall, it really is an impossibility. Uh, but we can, you know, I've always advocated for uh, no-fault absentee ballots uh, and all these things and getting them out of the state constitution and putting it all in statute. We, we come to a situation like this and we just have no flexibility. And that's the problem. That's been the problem all along. Uh, so I will continue to advocate for uh, a change to the state constitution and to put this language in statute. And then we can decide if we want to go a different direction in the state. Yeah, let's talk about the absentee ballot language that Connecticut has. So there's an illness clause. I would assume, though, that that yes. means that people need to know ahead of time about that and order their ballots. What is the communication around that going to look like? Well, we are planning to mail an application for an absentee ballot to every primary voter in the state. Uh, we can do that with the federal grant uh, just for this one occasion. Uh, and then on that application, it will explain how you can get an absentee ballot from your local town. Uh, you would have to mail that to them or drop it off at town hall. Uh, and then that you would get an absentee ballot. So it will explain right on the application exactly the language. And uh, if you are unable to get to the polls due to illness, if you think that's the situation, then you would check the box and then you would send away to get an absentee ballot. Now, you've been an advocate for early voting. It has not passed uh, at this point, but is this another argument to allow early voting, uh, to give the yes, state more course. flexibility in this yes. kind of situation? Yeah, exactly. Voters uh, deserve opportunities, more opportunities to vote. 41 states have all these things. They have uh, different ways, you know, more vote by mail. They have early voting, more days of early voting. Florida has 10 days of early voting. Texas has 30. 
I think that's a bit much. But, uh, you know, so uh, we're getting to the point where Connecticut voters just don't have the same opportunity to vote as other states. And that worries me. Yes, I do think we need to look at everything we're doing and try to streamline it. It is very difficult to get an absentee ballot, even if you're just going to be out of the jurisdiction, which is the typical reason people get absentee ballots. Uh, You still have to do it all by mail. Things have to be mailed back and forth. There's a time lag. Uh, it is difficult. So I would anticipate we will look at some of that at least to streamline what we're already doing. Whether you're doing early voting or you're doing voting by mail, I mean, the, the question of election security does come up. How do you control that when you have a longer time period and you're not physically talking to someone at the polls and looking at their licenses? Uh, well, you remember, I mean, we, people do register in advance, uh, we, as it is now, just like we do now. We have absentee balloting now. If you get an absentee ballot, you're checked off the list as having voted. That's the primary way we check to make sure people don't vote twice. Uh, and that's why it has to be in at least a week before the election so that process can occur. Uh, of course, you know, if you're... Uh, if, if you're the one voting, they check you off the list and they check your signature. They check to make sure that you're a bona fide voter. And that's how we've always done it. This would just be, there's just going to be more people getting them, I think, uh, for this election. And don't forget, everything we're talking about is really just for the June primary. We are in an emergency situation, and that's the difference. Uh, you, we have to make some accommodations for people to be able to cast their ballot. That's what makes this so difficult. We're really we're really tied in when it comes to how we can process this. And there's an enormous amount of effort and work that goes into all the mailing back and forth of the absentee ballots. So that's the biggest problem, honestly. Um, the part about checking people's identity, we've, we've always done it this way. And of course, when you first register, if you register at the DMV, which is where most people are registering now, we have a signature checking system. We have uh, signatures on record, and it all goes into an electronic system. It's also checked at the local level. So people, you know, you'll get a card in the mail when you first register to make sure you actually live at that address. So there are multiple ways we check on people uh, besides just the actual showing of the license at the uh, at the actual polling place. Uh, so um, it's no different huh. than it ever has been, and uh, hopefully it works. There are so many logistics that go into it. It's a problem, you know, not just for Connecticut, all of the other states uh, in this presidential primary season, as well as for the presidential election, are also facing. Uh, Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, I appreciate you talking with us and taking the time. You be well and be healthy. Thanks so much, Jen. You too. All right, well, that's going to do it for us on The Real Story. We will be here for you again next week. And remember, if you missed any of these segments or you want to rewatch them, they will be on fox61.com. Thank you so much, and you be well and be healthy with your family.